wonderful and heavenly father we just want to say thank you lord for this beautiful morning you have given us father thank you lord for gathering your saints once again father it's not by accident it's by divine plan and purpose that you brought each and every one of us here to this morning we just want to say thank you lord for the very breath of life that we were able to get up this morning and just praise our god and say thank you lord for giving us a new day and truly we ask you lord that you come down and minister to us this morning because we have only you lord and we can only turn to you lord because you are our god and our king pray for the entire worship team as we back up this morning that your presence will fill this place father we are not doing anything for ourselves father but we are doing it all for your glory father and truly let your presence come down and touch your people this morning pray for the word that's going to come that the word would come as a two-edged sword touching each and every heart tonight it's not the speaker lord but it's you lord who's going to speak to us this morning and i pray that as you speak to us father our lives would be changed our lives would be renewed our lives would be something beautiful to you father and i pray that lord you would continue to bless this entire service father in jesus precious name we ask amen and amen Jesus. i uh-huh. 
skies of Bethlehem appeared a star while angels sang to lowly shepherds three wise men seeking truth who traveled from afar hoping to find the child from heaven falling on their knees they bowed before the humble Prince of Peace. 
I bring an offering of worship to my King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I bring. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. Oh Lord, I bring an offering to you. The sun cannot, the sun cannot compare to the glory of your love. There is no shadow in your presence. No mortal man would dare stand before your throne, before the Holy One of heaven. By your blood, and it's only through your mercy, Lord, I come. I bring an offering of worship to my King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. Oh Lord, I bring an offering to you. Yes, Lord. Oh Lord, I bring an offering to you. Oh Lord, I bring an offering to you. worship God in our own words this morning. Yes, Lord. We are here this morning yes, Lord. in the presence of the Almighty God. Yes. We are here to bring Him an offering of yes, worship Lord. to our King. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Oh Lord, we worship You. We bring an offering
wonderful counselor his name shall be everlasting father his name shall be prince of peace mighty god his name shall be Everlasting Father, His name shall be Prince of Peace, Mighty God, His name shall be Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. Let's, let's just raise our voices and thank yes, God thank you. today. Thank and every day of our lives that he is with us he's always been with us no matter what we have been through no matter what hurdles we have leaped over God has been with us for every mountain you have helped us to climb every valley that you have helped us to rise up from thank you Lord that even in the difficult times when we didn't see anything happening in our lives you were there with us, yes, Lord. Lord. You stood faithful, Lord. Even when we took the wrong turn in our lives, Lord, you stood faithful. Today we want to honor you. Today we want to glorify you. Today we want to lift you up, Lord yes, Jesus, Lord. and say thank you, thank Emmanuel. You, thank, you, thank you for being with us. God with us. And help us to, Lord, we always remember yes. that you are with us. God with us. And that we will carry you in our hearts wherever we go, Lord. And share your love with others, Father. We want to bless you this morning. We want to bless you, Lord. And thank you for who you are in our lives and in the midst of us all. I thank you, Father, for the word that will be, be spoken over us today, Lord. And I just bless you that it will cut into our hearts, Lord Jesus. We will hear it. We will hear it and give you the glory, Father. In your mighty name, I ask it and pray. Amen. 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 Let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 1. John is the fourth gospel and distinct from the other three gospels which are called the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke. They are grouped together because they contain similar accounts of Jesus' acts here on earth and things that he did. And though they have different perspectives at times, uh, there is no conflict really because they are writing about what Jesus did, where he walked, what he did, the miracles that he performed. They are writing about it from their unique perspective. And so we see the same stories repeated in some of the Gospels, but, but from a different angle. John wrote his Gospel last, and he, he makes uh, an attempt to talk more about the character of God, the character of Jesus, rather than explain in intricate detail about Jesus' acts. We find more the things that he did, uh, the miracles that he performed, and all those things we find in detail in the other three Gospels. But John focuses more on really who Jesus is. And even when he talks about miracles and he explains the things that Jesus did, he calls them signs because he's pointing to the character of Jesus that is coming through uh, underneath the surface of the miracle. So we're reading this morning from John chapter 1 and verse 1 to 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to be a witness of the light, and all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, 
nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The other gospels in some shape or form uh, talk about the birth of Christ, and they talk about it from the aspect of the, the things that happened, the baby in the manger, the angel visiting uh, Mary and Joseph, the journey, the wise men, the shepherds, the angels. We find aspects of that birth, uh, that, uh, of the birth of Christ described in the other gospels. But John, being different, starts from a very different place and uh, is not the usual Christmas story that we read as he opens his gospel. As we read from verse 1 to 5, we see that um, John was really talking about the existence, the pre-existence of Jesus. The other gospels start from the place of Jesus being born into this world uh, in, in the flesh. And at Christmas time, those are the songs we sing. We sing, for Christ is born of Mary. And, and all the, the songs that we sing, the carols, they tell us about Jesus being born in the flesh and how he came uh, into this world. And sometimes when we sing these songs and we read these stories over and over, we might tend to think that, you know, that was the first appearance of Jesus. That's when he actually came into existence. But here, John sets the record straight and he says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was a reference to Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we find um, John talking about the Trinity here. He talks about Jesus being with God and that Jesus was God. So he's talking about the fact that Jesus and God are both God, they're both divine beings, but they are not one and the same. They are two distinct beings as well. And then verse 2, he says, he was in the beginning with God. So right at the start of his gospel, John is uh, emphasizing the pre-existence of Jesus. And he's telling the Jews, this is not the first time he appeared. This is not the time that, that he, uh, if you think that he was created, this is not that but he existed in the beginning with God. And verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. So here John is even talking about the existence of Jesus at the point of creation. He's saying that Jesus was part of the creative process, so he's establishing his pre-existence and his divinity even before he goes into talking about Jesus coming to live among men. And then in verse 4 and 5, he says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So he's going back to creation, and those first words, let there be light, and how light was defined and distinct from darkness, and then he's bringing it in how when Jesus came into the world also there was light and his light shone in the darkness. So these few verses of John are really so beautiful and so deep because they tell us that Jesus existed from the beginning of time. And then he shifts gears in verse 6 and he starts to talk about John the Baptist. He says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. So he's talking about Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, who came before as a forerunner to prepare the way for the Messiah. He prepared and opened the hearts, he softened the hearts of people so that they might be ready to accept who this Messiah was. And then back to verse 9 again, John goes back to describing Jesus. So he's talking how Jesus came into the, into the world and he came as a light of the world. But when he came as a, as a human being, fully God and fully man, he was rejected, he was not recognized, he was not accepted, he was uh, cast aside. But yet, to those who recognized who he was, to those who believed in him, who stood upon his word, he gave that right, that privilege to become the children of God 
this was given to all those who believe in his name and the relationship was not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but instigated, initiated and completed by God. And then we go to verse 14 and it says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And this is really the verse that I want to dwell on for a few minutes this morning. Because even though this is just one verse and one sentence, we find that John has packed into it actually the entire gospel story. And he says it just going from phrase to phrase as if it was something that happened in a day. It's just such a simple statement. Uh, but we see that he's really talking first that the word became flesh. That's talking about Jesus coming down to this earth as a baby and dwelt among us talking about his lifespan here on earth and those 33 years that he spent living and walking among men. And then we beheld his glory, that is John speaking from the perspective of the disciple and uh, the disciples and also for uh, all those who believed in him that they were able to see, they were able to behold the glory of God and he was the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But even though John packs this into one tiny sentence, the truth is that the word becoming flesh, God's plan, was something that was planned and pre-planned and prophesied over. It was not just a tiny little happening tucked into a little verse there. It was not a sudden ad hoc decision of God that he thought of on the spur of the moment, but it was something done, God's divine foresight. And as, as the word became flesh, that very act was fraught with challenges, with pain, with unforeseen circumstances, and shocking and surprising many people. But at the same time, we have on one hand, all these difficulties and all these challenges and all these unforeseen things from, from you know, a human perspective, but from the divine perspective and from the word of God, we know that Jesus coming into the world was planned and prophesied. And we know that there are hundreds of prophecies about the birth of Christ down to minute details. And all those prophecies have been fulfilled, even though the prophets who spoke those at that time really had no understanding of what they were speaking. They, even in their own lifetime, they did not have an understanding because they died before the fulfillment of their prophecies. So they just spoke the words that, that the, the, the Holy Spirit anointed them to speak and write. But even as they did it, they had no idea. They had no real concrete understanding of what they were writing. But every prophecy, every word that they spoke has come to pass. And it shows us that God had a plan. God had a plan. And his plan was fulfilled. But just because God had a plan didn't mean that everything went perfectly from our eyes. The amazing thing was that though it was God's plan, though it was prophesied, though it was orchestrated by God, it was fraught with the ugliness and the uncertainties of our humanness. I want to look at for a few minutes this morning some of the somewhat, you know, ugly and unsavory things that happened before and during the birth of Christ. And I share this to you because we've sometimes been uh, conditioned to think that Christmas is very pretty. And Christmas is pretty and it's beautiful. And even when you come into church during December, you find that the church looks more beautiful and more pretty than usual, right? When you walk on the streets, things have been transformed, uh, places have been painted and decorated, and uh, many of you, I'm sure, have decorated your home at least with something that you have hung up or with lights to make it look beautiful or pretty during this time. But in actual fact, 
the birth of Christ and many things that surrounded it, that preceded it were in fact quite ugly. For example, let us take the genealogy. The genealogy of Jesus is mentioned in two of the Gospels and when we read through the genealogies, somehow we find people's names listed there and actually some of them were not that perfect and perhaps in our opinion not that suitable to be included into the genealogy of Christ. There were some names of people, we know that none of us are perfect, but there were some names of people firstly who came from you know different races and especially in our context we tend to think that our race is the best, we are better than all, we must protect its purity and sometimes when it comes to you know people getting married or other life choices, we tend to focus on this uh, race issue a little bit more than usual and sometimes whisper where well, so and so's mother is this or father is that or did you know that their grandmother was so and so and we have many opinions about these things because we tend to think in our hearts that certain races or th certain ethnicities are purer or better than others. But here in Jesus' genealogy we find people who, who were from gentile blood. We also find people who were by virtue of the mistakes that they had made in their life, by virtue of the wrong things that they have done, the messed upness of their lives, we would not think that we want to associate them with Jesus. You think that if, Je if God had this plan from the beginning of time that surely he could have made sure that everybody who was coming in that line would do what they are supposed to do and, and you know uh, be upright and not bring any shame to the family. But it challenges us because sometimes we think that there are people who are so messed up that God can't use them. And sometimes we think that people come from some kind of background that is not suitable to include them somehow in the things of the faith. But here we see something ugly in our human perception but somehow included in God's plan, people who weren't perfect people who had messed up, people like Rahab and Ruth with Gentile blood, people like David who had messed up big time, people like Solomon who strayed away from God, so many people who we would not think were worthy to be clubbed with the name of the Son of God, but yet through that ugliness the word became flesh. Then you think of Zacharias, turn for a moment to Luke chapter 1. Zacharias was John the Baptist's father, he was elderly, he had no children and when he went in to perform his priestly duties, an angel comes and gives him a shocking promise that he is going to become a father. And in Luke chapter 1 verse 18 we see, and Zacharias said to the angel, how shall I know this for I am an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in my own time. So we find in Zacharias and this incident the, the ugliness of his unbelief. Here was an angel coming and giving a promise to Zacharias. but not surprisingly it was kind of shocking and unbelievable and Zacharias before he could stop himself just came out with his sincere unbelief and because he did not believe the word that the angel spoke to him he had to be mute until the promise was fulfilled. But I find something very special about Zacharias and that was that you know there is a difference between our struggle, our sincere struggle to believe in the promises and the words of God and there is a difference in when we are hard hearted and we refuse, we take a decision, an intentional decision to disbelieve in God.
And I believe that Zacharias was in the former camp where he, he loved God, he, he did want to believe, but, but he just couldn't. It was sincere, but very sincere unbelief on his part. But because there was unbelief, there had to be a result of that, and the result was that he was mute. But despite his unbelief and despite the muteness, God still fulfilled his plan, and John was born. But why, if Jesus', if, if Jesus birth had been planned, why, if John the Baptist was supposed to be born to Zacharias and Elizabeth in their old age, why couldn't God have made his very own priest to believe at first hearing? Why did Zacharias have to be so human that he didn't believe the words that the angel spoke to him? Why did that unbelief have to come out of him in such a divine moment. There was ugliness and embarrassment and challenge even when the angel spoke to Mary and Joseph. If you look at Matthew chapter 1, we find in verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Why did Joseph have this struggle? Why did he have these thoughts inside of him? He was struggling and he was wondering, he was in turmoil what to do because he knew the fact that Mary was with child before their wedding meant that there was going to be some uh, talk about the town. There was going to be some embarrassment. There was going to be shame because how could anybody understand this tall story that they could that, that really happening to Joseph and Mary when Joseph and Mary did not fully understand it themselves? So here was God's plan being worked out, but while God's plan is being unfolded through the lives of Joseph and Mary, they themselves are being dragged through the mud. They are going through embarrassment. They are going through shame. They are probably going, walking in the marketplace, hearing the whispers of people. And this is not something that went on for a day or two, but something that went on for very many months. And we don't know what kind of, you know, uh, mental pressure they would have been under even while God was in the process of blessing them to be parents of the Son of God. And when these nine months were over, we find that their struggles didn't end at that point. They had a long and an arduous journey to Bethlehem. As they traveled along the way, I'm sure it would have been so difficult. It would have been, uh, there would have been many uncertainties in their minds. And even though God had all the time in the world to prepare a beautiful palace for his son to be born, why is it? that he allowed this couple to not even be sure of a room, a humble room that they could stay in, in, in the inn. And why was it that everything, even about the very place that they would stay, was so uncertain and so poor and so lowly that the Son of God ultimately had to be laid in a manger where there was cattle. Why would they have to go through things like this when God had all the time in the world to plan out everything so well and do it without difficulty? Their struggles didn't end when the baby was born. If we look down, Matthew chapter 2, verse 13, it talks about how the kings left after worshipping and recognizing Jesus. And verse 13 says, Now when they had departed, that is the kings or the wise men, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt I called my son. Here was the son of God, 
being born and lying in this manger, and if all the struggles of his parents and even the lowly way of his birth up to that point wasn't enough, now his life is in danger. There is a threat and they have to flee. Before his birth, during his birth, and after his birth, all these periods were fraught and covered and wrapped up in ugly human circumstances. If we go back to John chapter 1, which we read at the beginning, go back to chapter 1 verse 10, and it talks about Jesus being in the world, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Now Jesus is an adult, and he's coming into really exposing who he is to the people. But John acknowledges that the ones to whom Jesus came did not recognize him. You know how we get sometimes when people don't recognize us? Sometimes we think that everybody should know who we are. And we get insulted when they don't know who we are. Sometimes when we want to get something done, we say things like, don't you know who I am? Or don't you know that I'm connected to so-and-so? And we name drop. And we, as human, puny human beings, we feel insulted when people don't give us the due respect or recognize who we are or what stock we come from or what kind of a family name we hold. But here was the Son of God, and he comes into the world, and he comes into the people, and the world did not know him. They did not recognize him. So if as human beings we feel insulted, can you just imagine what kind of an insult it is for the Son of God when he walks among the people whom he created, and they do not recognize him or give him the respect that he deserves. And verse 11, it says, he came to his own. That means he came to the Jews, his own people, and his own did not receive him because the Jews themselves did not believe in Jesus' divinity. And so not only was he not recognized, he was not received, he was not accepted. With all God's planning and foresight, this is the kind of ugliness that Jesus went through. And even I don't like to talk about it at Christmas, right to the very end of his life, when he was dragged through the streets, when he was beaten and mocked and spat upon, and when his flesh hung and blood poured down, there was nothing pretty about the sufferings of Christ. There was nothing pretty about the cross. It was ugliness through and through. But despite that ugliness, in spite of that ugliness, in the midst of all that ugliness, God was working out his plan, which he had planned from the beginning of time. And at Christmas, our focus is very often on that which is pretty and beautiful and pleasant. And we've been even conditioned to think that at Christmas, we must, all must be well. All must be well in our homes. All must be well in our relationships. All must be well in every aspect of our lives. And sometimes even though things are not all that well or not all that beautiful, we make an effort to cover it up and show it to people uh, in a different way because we believe that it is the most wonderful time of the year and somehow we need to show everyone that our lives are wonderful. But in fact, the first Christmas was not all that wonderful from that perspective. As I shared with you this morning, it was quite ugly, to be honest. It was ugly because Jesus came from a line of imperfect people, people who are unfit to be associated with him. Jesus came amidst parents who were walking through embarrassment, and shame and gossip. Jesus was born at the end of a very long journey to poor people and those who could not even at that moment find a proper place to stay and give birth to him. 
But yet, we find both Mary and Joseph taking God at his word, believing the words that the angels spoke to them, and even though they wouldn't have fully understood it, they trusted and they obeyed, and the word became flesh. That is, God's plan was worked out amidst a lot of ugly and unexpected and unsavory, challenging circumstances. In the midst of the ugliness, God was at work. I shared all these snippets of the Christmas story and the life of Christ just to impress upon you one thing. And that is, we are very often like the Christmas tree. Our lives have a lot of ugliness, brokenness, and unsavory things that go on, even at Christmas time. Sometimes we are like the messed up people in the genealogy of Christ. We've done some crazy messed up things, and perhaps we don't think that we are fit to have our name clubbed with the king of the universe. Or perhaps others don't think that we have any place in serving Christ. Sometimes our lives are difficult and challenging. Sometimes we go through embarrassing, shameful situations. Sometimes we are on a tough, difficult journey that might lead us through poverty, that might lead us through want, that might lead us quite frankly with no place to lay our head at times. Maybe no food to eat, maybe no proper place to live. Maybe all kinds of challenges that we don't even want to mention to others. Sometimes our lives are filled with threat, maybe with lack of security, and maybe our lives are also filled with those moments where we struggle to believe and take God at his word, and then have to go through a period of chastisement. But I just want to encourage us all this morning your life doesn't have to be perfect for God to do his plan and his work in your life. In fact, the Christmas story tells us, above all, that in the midst of ugliness, in the midst of pain, in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of disbelief, in the midst of shame, in the midst of embarrassment, God is at work and his plan will come to pass. All he requires of us is that we take him at his word and we obey. Mary and Joseph, with the little understanding, with the little revelation they had, they obeyed. They didn't run away. They didn't find fault with one another. They didn't lash out at God, even though they had many months to ponder on this. Sometimes you can bear up with shame and embarrassment for a, for a short time. But to live with it for months and months on end is a struggle for the best of us. But they took God at his word and they followed through faithfully. And even though they wouldn't have understood, and even, maybe sometimes even now we understood, we cannot understand why God could have, you know, just made things perfect. It's like when we as human beings are preparing for the birth of a child, I would say, mostly the first one. After that, you kind of lose the plot. But when it's your first child, you know, you need everything to match. You need everything done, you know, way in advance. The preparation that we as, you know, incumbent parents go through is unbelievable, unfathomable, and unexplainable to these children. So if we as human parents go through that kind of preparation 
And if we as human parents desire to give the very best and just have everything so well planned out, wonder why God, having all power vested in him and the ability to plan everything beautifully without a hitch, why did he allow all this ugliness to transpire while he worked out his plan? I believe it was he wanted to just make things real to us for us to know that life is messy and sometimes we mess up. Life is tough and sometimes no matter how sincere we are, we find it hard to hold on to the promises of God. Life is tough and sometimes it sends us through challenging, lonely, difficult roads. Like the road to Bethlehem or like the road to the cross. But through all of that, he just wants to encourage us this morning. He will work it out. He will work it out. And you know, as we go through these next couple of weeks and there's so much of pressure to be perfect, to have everything done perfectly, to have the beautiful, perfect family photograph when maybe you're not even talking to each other, God wants us to know that we don't have to pretend before him. We don't have to put some bandages on all the broken areas of our lives and just kind of get through this period. But we can be real. And we can realize that through all of the messed up stuff, just trust him, just obey him in the way that you know how to do it best. And he will work it out. He will work it out. And may his plans and his purposes be fulfilled in our lives. Not just during this month, but you know, in the coming year as well. Let's bring our brokenness. Let's bring our ugliness. Let's bring that shame and that embarrassment. Let's bring that lack. Let's bring all those unresolved, uh, irre irreconcilable, in our opinion, relationships. And let's lay it at his feet and determine that we will trust him, we will obey him, and we will see him working through all those messed up areas of our lives. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. You are at work in hearts and lives this morning, even as we are quietly in your presence. We just bring, Lord, all these situations before you. And we ask, Spirit of God, that you would minister to us, that you would be God with us. You'd be, you won't be God far from us, but you would be God with us, in the midst of us, present, you're not ashamed of the ugliness, Lord. You're not ashamed, you're not turned off by the mess-ups. But you came to rescue us. You came to walk with us. You came to be with us, Jesus, our Emmanuel. So I pray, Lord, this morning that you'll minister to every bleeding heart. You'll minister to every broken spirit this morning. And you'll encourage us to walk with you sincerely and see you work it out in our lives. Amen. Emmanuel.
Lord this morning.
able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before his throne with exceeding great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.